You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. you. Hey everyone, welcome to another awesome episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul and I have the pleasure of having Mr. Alan Erickson of Indemnus, a company that's trying to pave the way for flight over people operations. Alan, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. How are you this morning? Absolutely. No, I was wanting to make sure I said your name right because it's kind of one of those difficult names to say and you were saying that it's actually the Latin word for, um, is it moving without harm or without harm? Indemnus is the Latin word for without harm or injury. Indemnity is derived from indemnus. That is awesome. That is awesome. Now tell us a little bit about your company, which is focusing on building ballistic parachutes for drones. Is that correct? It is. Indemnus was started by myself and uh, four, five other co-founders. Um, we all came from the TV industry, working for major networks. And uh, we started using drones when they came out and started testing parachute systems to, you know, be a risk mitigation tool, flying on closed sets around people. And we really tested them. And what we found is that we, we actually had a hundred percent failure rate in actual testing, not doing hover deployments. And one day out of frustration kind of came up with the concept for our first product and we started the company. That's awesome. So when you're saying you had a hundred percent failure rate, I'm guessing you were using other, kind of parachute options that were out there on the market. And I know that there's a couple different kinds. So what were you seeing in the field that was failing and what kind of parachutes were you using? Yeah. So we were using, we tested ballistic ejection systems. Um, we tested a couple spring based parachute launchers and we tested drop safe, which is a rapid canopy fill system. And how we were testing them is we rigged the aircraft up to simulate the failures that we had seen flying because we were flying six days a week. Um, and when you fly that much, you will see failures, especially in the early days. You know, drones weren't as reliable back then. And uh, what we found is that when the drone would fail, it would enter a roll and tumble scenario. And when the parachute would deploy, it would get wrapped up in that roll and tumble. Um, so we want to get a successful recovery. And uh, it, it was a really frustrating problem to have. And, you know, we looked at the problem and thought, how could we fix this? No, I think that's great. So your solution is a ballistic solution. So it's able to actually shoot the parachute outside of that. You called it the roll and tumble. I remember the old S-800s calling it the flip of death, essentially. Oh, yeah. And I remember actually seeing a studio here in Albuquerque flip uh, an S-800 on the highway. Uh, So I've actually seen that happen before, and I know it's a crazy thing. So your system, does it actually shoot from the top? Does it shoot from the side? How exactly does it work? So, uh, you know, multi-rotors are omnidirectional. They can travel in any direction. So when we went into creating the product, the Nexus, we took into account that orientation of the parachute should not matter. How it launches, if it launches from the side, forward, back, left, right, front, shooting straight up. That shouldn't matter because when the aircraft rolls, we don't know what orientation the aircraft's in when the parachute shoots out. The next problem that you know we had to tackle was that issue of entanglement. If that parachute lines at the core of the aircraft, it can get winched back in. Um, you know, The parachute, if you're not ballistically launching it, has a pretty high probability in the worst case scenarios of just never escaping that roll at all. It just gets kind of caught while the drone's rolling and the parachute's deploying. So how we solved that is we created the Nexus. And what the Nexus is, is it's a inflatable tube, kind of like an inverted sock where the parachute is attached to the end of that tube when it's inflated. But when it's in its stored state, the parachute's inverted inside that tube and it actually reaches full deployment in about four milliseconds. And during that deployment, the parachute rises through the tube, the lines and the parachute itself are protected until that tube is fully inflated and it's rigid. And now the parachute lines are outside the axis of the propellers, their control surfaces, everything on the aircraft that it could get entangled. So that for those last three to five rolls in a worst case scenario, 
the parachute line still doesn't get winched back into the aircraft, tangled up, damaging your aircraft, your payload, and your recovery is never compromised. I mean, we shoot the parachute out really fast. If you've seen the videos, it is insanely quick. And that tube, I mean, when I say it's a rigid tube, you can pick an M600 that's fully loaded up by one of those tubes, and the tube doesn't bend. I mean, it becomes like a piece of steel. So that's how we solve the problem by moving the attachment point of the parachute outside the axis of the drone's roll and control surfaces. That's awesome. So you brought up a couple of points. Um, you said if you had an M600 with a full payload, you're going to be able to protect that. What size of drone will your um, parachute system work on? So it's very scalable to several hundred pounds very easily. Um, we've only been building for aircraft under 55 pounds right now, specifically DJI aircraft. We're releasing for the Inspire 2 first, then shortly right thereafter we'll be making the M200 series and M600 series available as well. Awesome. Very cool. Now, I've seen some flight over people waivers granted for for closed set motion filming, um, and I've even seen one here in Albuquerque, um, but I believe that there are certain caveats to that waiver. They've got to have prop cages and all these other things. I did not see anything about a parachute system, but also the person who filed that waiver said that the FAA would not grant them the flight over people if it was outside of the closed set environment where they're having the safety briefing. People are actively participating. I mean, essentially, it was just like an extension of the MPTOMs that were taken away in November of 2016. So one question I have for you is the parachute systems that you've developed do you believe that this is what the FAA is looking for in order to approve flight over people waivers? And will there be any other necessary accessories to work with your system to get those approvals? Yeah, absolutely. I just want to touch on real quick. The current flight over people waivers that are active are for really lightweight aircraft, kind of like the snap drone for CNN. The 333 exemptions have all now been rescinded all the clothes set currently. And then they've been for certain fixed wing aircraft that have the glide slope calculation where it can move away from the people if it fails. Um, and other than that, everything's pretty much been denied. And so looking towards the future, you know, our company was started with the goal of enabling safe flight over people, safe regulated flight. And we knew that anything smaller than an ultra lightweight drone is going to need some sort of parachute to slow it down. And we operated really silently for about three years doing research and development before we even put up a public website. And, uh, you know, we have a pretty big facility here, about 12,000 square feet for research and development. Uh, we have 22 employees comprised of engineers, designers, people like that. We do a lot of testing. And when we went public with our tech at Exponential in 2017, the FAA approached us and, you know, was really interested in some of the recovery scenarios we we're showing that were really violent. And the FAA was already looking at putting together with ASTM a work group to standardize the testing and engineering behind these parachute safety systems with the goal of it being an avenue, one of the avenues to achieve flight over people. And so we brought together an industry work group comprised of myself and indemnists as the work group lead, we brought on DJI, Amazon, Mars Parachutes, Fruity Shoots, and ParaZero, and then several other entities that gave feedback, but that was the core group that was involved. And we developed a 38-page testing engineering standard, which we're still finalizing, um, but, you know, just minor editorial stuff. It's very comprehensive, and it covers the engineering how your software, you know, what has to be included in your software, your manual radio, all these things that any system that's going to enable flight over people has to be a turnkey package. And we've been working on that since May of last year, meeting generally twice a week uh, with, you know, involvement of different government officials, CAA people, helping craft this into something that hopefully can be used to enable flight over people. So that is, you know, that to answer your question, our product is specifically designed to meet and exceed those regulatory standards when they come out so that you can get flight over people. I think that's awesome. And I mean, that's why we're here talking today. 
Uh, but do you have to have any other accessories? Let's say I have the Inspire 2 package with your Nexus system, which will be coming out soon. Um, and I mean, it only makes sense that your product will come out when it's, you know, available to get a waiver for flight over people, you know, but would we need any other accessories, say like prop cages or anything to comply with the FAA standards? I mean, we did a podcast on the proposed standards for flight over people. And I think it was like a document that was leaked out and I forget exactly how it was leaked out, but we were, they mentioned, you know, the calculations, um, that go into whether it's going to be okay or not to fly over people. And it all comes down to weight and how much uh, load there is when the drone hits the ground. And, you know, all, yeah, exactly. Um, so my question is, are there other accessories that would be necessary? Right, right now, no, uh, that hasn't been stated. And part of the reason why is for a parachute safety system, a parachute recovery system to enable flight over people, it has to have what's called a flight termination system on it that can cut the propellers. Those propellers can't be spinning when they come down to the ground. Um, you know, so you, you don't have any worry of, you know, laceration injury from the blades spinning. Um, and all of this has to be independently tested by a CAA approved third party. So it, you can't take my word for it at Indemnist that I say our product works. Someone who's independent and trusted in our first case by the FAA will have to validate and verify our product against the standard, a minimum of 45 deployments covering the full flight envelope of the aircraft, covering immediate full power loss, covering things like critical number motor failure. So on a quad, you'd lose one motor. On a hexa, you'd lose two adjacent motors, et cetera. And this all has to be validated that your software is working. How quickly does your automatic deployment software initiate and work? All of these factors are, it's a really well thought out standard that's going to be coming out, you know, that is about safety. I mean, it's about ensuring public confidence, government confidence and confidence for the pilots that if someone makes a product that meets this standard, which is an ASTM international standard, the system's going to work. And I'm, I can say I'm of the belief that, let's say, a 55-pound drone or 54.99-pound drone, that's probably going to need an airbag on it in a lot of cases because if you want to do things like fly it with a 15-mile-an-hour crosswind, technically you could make a 55-pound drone fall at 7 miles an hour vertically, but if you're flying in a crosswind, it's now traveling horizontally if it fails. And, you know, these are all things you have to think about when you're talking about flight over people and people getting hurt. I think that's a really good point. So when can we expect to see these new guidelines coming out so that people can get flight over people waivers? You know, I, I, I would hope sometime towards the end of 2018 that it'll start to occur, but it could be 2019. I'm, it's the FAA. It, you know, in our case, I'm, the government could shut down next week. We don't know. <laughs> um, or tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. Um, so one question that I have is that, um, so what would the FAA define as a success rate for a parachute deployment system? Do you have to have a 100% success yeah, rate? You do. You, um, you in testing, you have to have a 100% success rate. And if you experience a failure of the parachute recovery system in testing and deployment, uh, you have to be able to explain, document, and show how you will prevent that failure from ever occurring again, and then retest. Um, but it has to have a 100% success rate. Uh, and we are talking about flight over people, um, specifically, you know, non involved persons is the goal. And so if you're going to be able to fly your drone in an urban environment over other people in the future, the safety has to be there that it can be done without any risk to anyone on the ground. I, no, it makes sense. It makes 100% sense. Do you see the FAA instilling any other requirements outside of the parachute that may be necessary to obtain the flight over people waiver? Could you see any pilot requirements could you see any aircraft requirements? Yeah, um, I could definitely, you know, personally envision pilot training requirements, whether that comes, you know, from training that's provided by us or an expanded 
you know, set of training, th things like that. I mean, think about it like this. All right, you take our system, we will have a defined minimum flight altitude. So if you want to fly over people, you have to take off, get up to that altitude because that is the altitude that whether you're doing 60 miles an hour or hovering, we know the system will work in every scenario. You have to be trained to fly in those conditions. You know, a lot of people will probably be doing more urban flight. You have to think about things like power lines, you know, obstacles. There's a lot of different scenarios. What are your potential ditch points if you're not going to use your parachute? Um, there's just a lot of different training factors that I think need to be expanded on so that it can be done safely. Very interesting. So there's a minimum altitude that your system works. Oh, yeah. Any Anyone who tells you that the, their parachute works at, you know, let's say 20 feet or 30 feet. Yeah, I mean, think about it like this. You take an Inspire 2. It does about 58 miles an hour, you know. Or 85 with a tailwind. It, yeah, I was just about to say, we, we test in those conditions. I've gotten an I-2 up. It caused a single motor failure with a violent roll and flat spin at 90 miles an hour. We test well beyond what the aircraft's rated for. Um, but if you're doing that kind of speed, you're going to just smash into the ground. So when yeah. we talk about minimum deployable altitude, it's the minimum deployable altitude within the full flight and failure envelope of the aircraft. Basically, no matter what happens, the software is going to deploy. It's going to work. And all of these systems have a manual deployment function, a integrated independent radio, independent of your controller that can deploy the system. Um, let's say you see it having like a GPS flyaway or something, and you just need to arrest your aircraft. You can manually deploy it, but the reality is the average human response time to a real failure situation on a drone that we've seen is about three to four seconds from the point of failure starting to them being able to respond. The software is designed to work far quicker than that. Now, that's interesting. So there's a communication going on between your system and the drones themselves, which makes sense why you're working with DJI. So will, new, will DJI have some sort of interface to integrate your drone onto existing systems? Or is this something that we would see with more prosumer grade drones in the future? I don't know about prosumer grade. I mean, the professional drones, there are ways to, you know, integrate a parachute system. You have to be able to cut the motors. Right, right now. And yeah. That, 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 that's, that's, you know, a big one. Um, for the standard that would be coming out and just from practical thinking. Well, if you take a Phantom, you have to tear apart an entire Phantom to get in to be able to rig up a motor kill system. On an I-2 or an M210 or M600, the process is either plug and play or your first time installation takes 10 minutes and after that it's just clip on, clip off like a GoPro. That's awesome. This extra controller that you talked about, so you would have some sort of manual takeover if you needed to deploy it for whatever reason. Is this something that would be like a bolt-on to the remote? It's designed to perfectly form on to the I2 M600 remotes, and then there's a separate version for the Sendence remote as well. And so it just clips on <clears throat> to the remote. It looks like it belonged there when it came from the factory. So it has RSSI, so it has real-time feedback and display of the status of the parachute, that it's armed, your signal strength, everything's good to go, and error display if you have an error in flight, along with an audible warning if you have an error in flight with a safety system to alert the pilot. Wow, that's awesome. So do you guys have pricing models yet on what the Nexus will cost the average pilot? We don't right now. We, we haven't set our pricing yet, to be honest. I mean, it, it's a to-be-determined kind of thing. All right. Um, can you give us a range at all or a potential launch date? Yeah, I mean, as a range, you, you, on the low end, you're probably looking at about $2,500 to start. Um, and then as far as a launch date, we're targeting Q2 for the I2 system and bringing out the M210 and M600 shortly thereafter. Um, and I'm a big part of that cost, I mean, obviously for this kind of for a parachute system designed for flight over people, all right, to give you an idea, for the I-2, there's a stack of engineering data about this big. Then there's an equal thick stack on the testing data. 
Um, and then you have the third stack, which comes from the independent testing third party that tests and validates everything. So it, it's not like buying the current off the shelf parachute systems that are just for risk mitigation, the amount of validation that goes into it. It's more like making an airbag for a car. I mean, it, it's really, it's a very serious process. I think that's awesome. I think you have a lot to be proud of, my friend. And I would love to be there for the launch of your product and uh, display it to the world and uh, help you get the message out. But I would say from our community and our listenership, we're really grateful to have you on the show. We're really, We are all really looking forward to seeing these requirements come out from the FAA for flight over waiver operations. In addition, seeing your product come to market. So I just want to say thank you very much for coming on the show and educating us on your ballistic parachute. Oh, thank you for having me. And if you or any of your listeners want to check out more, I Facebook is a great way to follow us. I we post a lot of stuff on Facebook, Facebook slash Indemnus, or our website, Indemnus.com. We have a whole media section there where people can check out videos and see the system in action. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Alan. I really appreciate you coming on the show. And everyone else, that is going to do it for us today. If you want to find out more about Alan Erickson and his team, just go to Indemnis, that's I-N-D-E-M-N-I-S dot com, and check them out. Alan, thank you again. That's going to do it for us today, guys. My name is Paul, and you're watching Ask Drone You.